Is there an American way of war? And is it any good? My name is Michael Shurkin, and welcome to my YouTube channel, Pax Americana, a conversation about world affairs, global conflict, the military strategy, and anything else that happens to be on my mind. Now, this question of American way of war is, uh, well, there's a lot has been written about it. There's a lot to be said. What, what I'm going to do here is actually I'm going to divide this into two parts, two videos, rather. In the first, I'm going to talk mostly about the arguments about of the American military historian Russell Wigley, who published a book in 1973 called The American Way of War. Now, obviously, since, obviously, since 1973, other scholars have come and they poked lots of holes in his arguments and criticized it. And a lot of his their criticism is actually very valid. But for our purposes, we're going to rely on Wigley to because I think he makes some really important points. And I'm going to add to that my own reflection based on my own experience working sort of within the belly of the American security establishment, working first in the CIA where I was involved in the Afghanistan war, and then subsequently in my time at the uh, Rand Corporation, I worked at the Rand Corporation for 11 years. Then afterwards, I'm going to do a second video, and I'm going to make sure to have links to that. And in the second video, I'm going to talk about French perspectives on the American way of war, because I think it's actually very interesting and really, really very relevant. It adds, I think, a lot to the conversation. So let's begin. Now, as I said, the, the main reference here is Russell Wagley's book, The American Way of War. And Wigley's argument really boils down to the following. He says that in the 19th century, American professional officers studied carefully Napoleon's campaigns through the interpretive lens, of course, of Clausewitz and Jomini. Of course, everybody else did this. This is not any unusual. They're just following the trend. This is exactly what the European theorists are, are doing. But what happened was, he says, that the Americans deduced from this the belief that that, that military strategy basically could be summed up as you, you fix the enemy army, you destroy it, and you, you destroy it in a, in a decisive victory. So it's all about the decisive victory. And the belief is that decisive battlefield victory is what leads you to a decisive war victory, a de decisive strategic victory. But it's all about you, you fix the adversary army and you destroy it in a decisive battle. That's it. This is the paradigm that uh, dominated everybody's thinking during the American Civil War. Both commanders on both sides, remember, they, they, both, they all had the same military education. They all would maneuver their armies around in the effort to try to fix the enemy army and then destroy it in a decisive battle. The belief being is that these decisive battles are what going to, what's going to win the war for, for your side. The apotheosis of this came with Generals Grant and General Sherman. In addition to having this belief in, in the need for decisive battle, they really took to heart the idea of doing everything you could to grind away the enemy armies, to absolutely destroy, destroy it. But not only that, they believed in this idea of going on the offensive, taking the fight into the, uh, to the enemy's homeland, and destroying it, destroying their ability to wage war. So you go from decisive battle to annihilation. This is a war of annihilation that they are not fighting. Wigley then argues, and this is probably the most controversial part of his argument, is that there's a direct line between Grant and Sherman in that generation and the World War II generation, uh, guys like Eisenhower and, and, and Patton. And the argument is that they brought to the business of World War II and they took with them the spirit of annihilation. So hence, he says, you have a very aggressive strategy against Germany and Japan, one in which you invade, you destroy their armies while also trying to destroy their homelands and their ability to wage war. So you use air power in order to devastate their homelands, destroy their resources, destroy their factories, destroy their cities, and do everything you can to just knock them out of the war. This is a war of annihilation. Uh, again, people have criticized this, but one thing, and I, 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 I think this is, this is useful for understanding this approach, the, according to, to Wigley, one of the intellectual bridges, if you will, between the, the Grant Sherman generation and then the Eisenhowers and the Pattons is none other than the naval theorist, uh, Alfred Thayer Mann, who publishes major work, The Influence of Sea Power. Uh, that book came out in 1890. Mann's influence is huge, and it was much greater than simply naval theory, and it had a really a profound impact, I believe, on American strategic thinking and American strategic culture. The argument that Mann makes is basically that, uh, you know, once upon a time, the U.S. Navy was too weak to take on an enemy fleet. Uh, so what you do is you focus on commerce rating, 
the idea being that you make war against the United States expensive by destroying their civilian shipping. But this is the enemy, this is an arm of the weak. Ideally, what you want to be able to do is you want to be able to go after the enemy fleet and destroy the enemy fleet, but the U.S. could not do that. However, Mayor uh, Mayen writes that, he's writing in 1890, in the late 1880s, like, if you want to play with the big guys, if, if you want to be taken seriously as a world power, if you want to play in that game, you need to be able to do this. And guess what? The United States actually has the power to do this. So what he argued for was building large fleets consisting of large battleships that are designed to find the enemy fleet and destroy it in a decisive naval victory. And the thesis, though, that man, I, I, that I think appealed to everybody, not just the, the, the American Navy, is the idea that if you have the ability to fight a war of annihilation, you should do it. You use this battle of annihilation to decisively destroy the enemy. And people took man and they used this as its argument for the U.S. basically uh, accepting its, its place as a world power. And this led to the Great White Fleet and, and all sorts of things that happened subsequently uh, where the United States started to develop really potent military capabilities of, of the kind that they could actually contemplate major decisive wars of annihilation against foreign powers. Wigley's, Wigley's arguments get, I think, even more nuanced and more interesting when he talks about the post-war era. Now there's, there's a problem. He says that the American military still retains this paradigm. They still retains this faith in, uh, in annihilationist warfare. However, the United States, because it's now a world power, it is now much more involved in limited wars with limited political objectives, now has to struggle to come to terms with how do you fight a limited war for achieving limited political objectives, where uh, a, a war of annihilation really is no longer appropriate. And the answer, Wagley says, is it doesn't do it very well. It struggles. So he talks about, for example, the Korean War. The Korean War is uh, this first great example of the United States finding itself in a war that, for policy considerations, it decides to wage in a limited fashion. The military is still geared towards wars of annihilation. You mobilize the entire national military, you completely destroy the enemy. Here, Truman opts not to mobilize the entire military, to fight it in a limited way, and to keep the fight limited to the Korean theater. For MacArthur, this is a problem. MacArthur, according to Wagley, really embodied the the sort of Clausewitzian, uh, Grantian approach to warfare. And he, the way he, MacArthur understood it, if you want to fight a war, the purpose is to have victory, total victory, and the way to do that is be destroying, by destroying the enemy's armies, which ultimately means destroying the enemy's ability to wage war, uh, of course. So, so he wanted to go up to China in a direct confrontation, in a total confrontation. And of course, Truman would have nothing of this, and, and MacArthur was fired. In the early stages of Vietnam, Kennedy had this idea of trying to embrace irregular warfare, trying to embrace limited war. And so he wanted there to be an entirely different doctrine, entirely different approach, which is this was the genesis of the creation of the Green Beret and the School of the Americas. And, and he really fostered this idea of like setting aside the annihilationist approach for something much more limited. According to Wiley, though, what happens in the Vietnam War is that in a sense, despite itself, the American military couldn't help but default towards these, these, these annihilationist approaches, which had a focus on destruction and firepower and destroying the enemy, which translated, according to Wigley, into an increasing practice of aggressive ground maneuver paired with a very aggressive aviation campaign designed to destroy North Vietnam's ability to wage war. Wigley adds to this post-war picture uh, a new development that he thought was very much in line with this uh, annihilationist approach that reinforced the annihilation approach, uh, annihilationist approach. And that was the rise of mostly civilian social scientists and other researchers, people trained in these new disciplines uh, known as operations research or systems analysis. And, and, and the sort of the big moment, the, the, big, the, the arrival of this approach on a major scale comes with the appointment as Secretary of Defense by Kennedy, the former Ford Chief of Operations, Robert McNamara. And Robert McNamara was really a evangelist of this idea of taking quantitative tools and quantitative methodologies and applying them to strategic issues. He says that, uh, and Wigley quotes him as saying, 
I am sure that no, this is McNamara, I'm sure that no significant military problem will ever be wholly susceptible to purely quantitative analysis. Wagley quotes him as asserting, but every piece of the total problem that can be quantitative and quantitatively analyzed removes one piece of uncertainty from a process of making a choice. The idea being to analyze as much of a strategic question as possible using quantitative methods, such that there's only a little bit left, that little bit that you can't actually apply quantitative analysis to, but at this point one has already reduced one's uh, uh, uncertainty to a great deal so that it's much easier to make a rational, calculated decision. And of course, McNamara had a very aggressive understanding of how far quantitative analysis can go, just how much you can do through qual quantitative analysis. Now, Wigley has his critics, as I mentioned before. Uh, perhaps the most important is uh, recent one is Brian Lynn, uh, who's writing in the 2000s. And Lynn, he wrote some really very good stuff, very much worth reading. Lynn said, for example, that, the, that uh, there really is no continuity between the Civil War and World War II. He says that that's absolutely absurd. And one of the reasons he says this is because between the Civil War and World War II, or really Civil War, War and World War I, the United States military had been involved in a host of very small wars. I'm talking about the Indian Wars, the Philippines insurrections, and even the Spanish-American War, such that like, it's just not, it's not true that they were busy thinking about major warfare. The uh, other argument he made is that he, he thought that Wigley was overstating the importance of doctrine, the importance of tradition. And he said that really the most important recurrent theme in American strategic thinking was improvisation. Why? Because the United States military was chronically unprepared for the wars that it got into. And every time it got involved into, in a war, it would have to scramble to try to figure out, well, what do you do? How do you fight this war? What's going on? So the American military would improvise. In a sense, he's making a historiographical argument. He's saying that culture, tradition, ideas are less important. Practical realities are more important. Now, from my own personal perspective as somebody who's come to this uh, relatively recently, I'm trained as a social 19th century social European historian. I'm not trained in military history, but I ended up in the CIA, and in the CIA I got involved in the Afghanistan war where I saw coin and all that stuff going on, and everybody's talking about about uh, Petraeus and FM3-24. And, and then from the CIA, I went on to the RAND Corporation. I worked at RAND for 11 years, and I really saw operations research, and my colleagues doing all sorts of really incredible work. A lot of it was really phenomenal, but, but also I got to see certain things at work. Now, among the things that I saw, was that it is true that even though post-World War II, the American military would often find itself in limited wars, and it at the time would struggle to come to think about limited wars and to try to get smart on, uh, on limited wars, it almost did it despite itself because it's like it's geared intellectually to do one thing and would force itself to try to do that other thing, but it never did it very successfully. Also, what would happen was, and this happened kind of right after Wigley published his book, but it validates his, his argument, is that even though the American military during the Vietnam War did think hard about, about, um, about irregular warfare, as soon as it could, already before the war had even ended, it raced to eject, reject all that stuff, discard it, and re-embrace big conventional warfare. It wanted really badly to think once again about fighting the Soviets, fighting the Warsaw Pact in Germany. And, and this is now another back to this comfortable uh, world of, of annihilationist warfare. And all those lessons of irregular warfare were, were jettisoned and forgotten. Similarly, and I witnessed this, with the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, the United States once again had to get smart on irregular warfare and get smart on counterinsurgency. But as soon as it could, and this happened during the, the Obama administration, the American military, almost gleefully jettisoned all that and said, you know what, screw that. We don't want to do this anymore. Let's get back to thinking about big warfare against not the Soviets anymore, but now the Russians and the Chinese. Just as in the 70s and 80s, the race to re-embrace conventional warfare resulted in things like the 1982 Doctrine Airland Battle. In this post-Afghanistan, post-Iraq iteration, the, the fruit is multi-domain operations, which I, I would argue is sort of the modern version. It's just a revision of airland battle in the sense that it's about big warfare, it's annihilationist, but it's also just super joint 
and it's about using tech and all these things in order to gain an advantage, in order to annihilate the enemy. I can give you another example. I, I once did a history, while well, I was at RAND, I did, I, I did a study of U.S. Army manuals from through the 20th century up until the 21st, and it's really remarkable to see how all the way through the late 1990s, the, the from the point of view of American Army general field manuals, there was war, right, big war, and all the other stuff. Now, the other stuff is actually what the Army ended up doing most of the time anyways, the limited wars, the small wars. But that was not really war from the point of view of the American military. That didn't really count. Real war is big war. And the other stuff is something else. These are special operations or these other things that you would do. In the 1990s, they even described those other things as M-O-O-T-W, MUTWA, right, or military operations other than war. It's not real war. It doesn't really count. Now, as part of that, I also want to talk about Wiley's arguments about the importance of the operations researchers and, and what the, that means. And of course, this is something that I saw when I was at RAND because I was surrounded by operations researchers. It became clear to me watching my colleagues and seeing what operations research can do that there is a relationship between operations research and conventional military activities, conventional military operations. Operations research is really very good at conventional warfare. Why? Because it's, it lends itself to quantification and quantitative analysis of quantitative data that can yield very, very helpful and beneficial results. So I don't want to dismiss the value of this, but the value is really huge. I'll give you an example of the sort of thing that uh, operations research is very good at. Operations research is very good at analyzing your force structure feeding into a computer the performance characteristics of your different equipment and different weapon systems and understanding how they maneuver, and then feeding in that of your, your, en your enemy, and then gaming it, modeling it, figuring out how it works, figuring out who's going to win, who's not going to win, what are the odds, what are the batting averages. So operations research could think about things like, okay, I want to improve my armor, uh, my tanks, so, because I want my tank units to become more lethal. So one way I could do that is I could put a bigger gun in the tank. So let's say I have a billion dollars to spend. Let's put a billion dollars worth of bigger tanks and bigger guns in our tanks. And then what you could do is you can program into your, your war games all of the performance characteristics of these bigger guns. Uh, bigger guns are more lethal, uh, bigger shell, greater range perhaps, more explosive power, et cetera, et cetera. And you can model this and figure out that your tanks with these bigger guns are going to be, I don't know, 12% more lethal in these situations, right? But then also through operations research, you could figure out, well, you know, there's some downsides to this. Bigger gun means bigger shells, which means you can keep fewer shells in the magazine in your tank, which means you need to be resupplied more often, right? Which is gonna place a greater burden on the logistical chain. Also, bigger gun is healthier, uh, heavier, which means the tank will require more fuel. This is also a strain on the logistical capabilities. Also, heavier gun, heavier tank, greater stress on the suspension and various tank parts, which is going to add to the maintenance requirements of the tank, puts further strain on the logistical, logistical capacity. All of these things are quantifiable, can be added into your program, into your algorithms, and then you can come out with a very refined, very quantitative list of all right, if we spend a billion dollars on bigger guns, these are the advantages, these are the disadvantages, and you can make a ra rational decision about whether or not this is a good investment of your money. Operations research, research is magnificent at that. It's good at conventional warfare, and it reinforces this preference for conventional warfare, which in the American way is invariably a nihilist, nihilist, nihilationist kind of effort where you're seeking decision on the battlefield by destroying the enemy. When it comes to things like counterinsurgency, however, this is a real problem. Why? Because there's nothing measurable. How do you measure progress? How do you measure if you're winning? Nevertheless, the U.S. military during the Vietnam War and then the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan put a considerable amount of effort, huge effort, to identify relevant data to collect relevant data, and then to build the programs and the games and the scenarios to try to build out and try to understand how do you win this kind of fight, and are we winning, and by how much. And bar and large, it didn't work. It failed because these are not fights that you can measure through 
quantitative analysis because it tends not to be about stuff. It tends not to be about explosive power and destroying the enemy. But because we keep trying, this reflects the fact that despite everything else, we keep thinking in terms of destruction, destroying things, blowing things up, decision, fighting, fighting a decisive battle. Even when coin theorists will tell you that there's no such thing and that's just not going to work because victory has to do with politics and legitimacy and all these other things that are completely unmeasurable. This intellectual predilection for operations research and quantitative analysis reinforces this favoritism towards big, heavy war, which reinforces or sustains this tradition, this Clausewitzian tradition of seeking the decisive battle and destroying the enemy. That, at least, is what I saw from my purge first at the CIA and then at RAND. Now, to this, I want to add another development that I think is very important, which is the fetishization, fetishization of technology. This uh, arguably came in World War II. Uh, I think it reflects several things. It reflects a, first of all, it reflects the fact that we've got lots of money. If you have lots of money, you can experiment with, with stuff, with tech. Uh, there's also this idea that, hey, any advantage you could have, why not, particularly if you have effectively unlimited funds, so, so go for it. But there's also the sense that the technology is sort of going to be sufficient. All we need is the tech, and this is going to give us a big advantage, in part because you can program this. You can punch in the performance characteristics of the tech, and you can model it and wargame it and understand it. You can figure out how, in a technical way, this is going to help you because this will increase your lethality, help you destroy stuff, and help you blow stuff up. This isn't going to help you understand hearts and minds or win over hearts and minds or do any of the political stuff, but we don't like doing that in any way. So really, ultimately, about destroying things. And this is why the tech is useful. Plus, you have the idea of tech being an offset because we can't compete quant qual quantitatively or numerically with uh, first the Soviets and now with the Chinese. So you need the, the tech to offset the, the numerical disadvantage. And, and I think that it's just a trait of American culture. I, I would describe in terms of modernism, uh, particularly mid 20th century modernism, this idea that tech equals modernity. And this is sort of an intrinsically a, a good thing. So the American culture really likes progress. We, we just like the tech both because of the advantage because we, we uh, identify it as progress, which is sort of a value in and of itself, and because we have nearly unlimited funds so we can spend whatever we want on all sorts of expensive doodads. The next video I'm gonna do, which was subsequent to this, I'm gonna look at the French perspective and talk to you about how uh, French military thinkers think about the American way of war, and I think it's a very useful addition to this conversation, but I think for the sake of brevity, brevity it, it's best to to cut this already into two videos. This video's already gone too long. So anyways, if you like this video, thank you very much. Please like and subscribe. Uh, also, uh, in the description, I've put some references to some books that you should check out. And of course, if you check anything out through Amazon, this uh, I, I get a little bit of money from Amazon, so this helps support the channel, and I really appreciate that. Also, you can please check out my Substack, uh, Pax Americana also, link in the description. You can find me on LinkedIn and Twitter, and also my own website, michaelsharkin.com. Thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing you in my next video. Thank you.